Okay. So we're going to talk about human um, development of the human embryo and fetus. So to start, we have to start with fertilization because that's the first step. In order for a new human to be produced, uh, an egg cell has to be fertilized. And so what do we mean by a, an egg cell has to be fertilized? What does it mean for an egg to be fertilized? A sperm has to combine with an egg so it can get all chromosomes. Yeah, an egg on its own, it can't grow into an embryo. It only has 23 chromosomes. It needs to be combined with a sperm cell to get the other 23 chromosomes. And that's what we call fertilization. So fertilization is the combining of male and female gametes, sperm and egg cells. Or if we're talking about a plant, it could be a pollen grain. So, uh, once that happens, do you remember the name for that fertilized egg cell, what it's called? Zygote. Zygote. The very first stage, the very first cell, that's called the zygote that's produced when a sperm cell and an egg cell combine. Remember, they're each carrying half the chromosomes. The word for that, haploid. They only have half the chromosomes. But when they combine, the zygote has the full number. That's called the diploid number. And then it starts to divide. That single cell goes through the process of mitosis, and it splits into two cells. And they split into four cells and eight cells and so forth. All of those reproductions are called, that happens through mitosis. <clears throat> that process is called cleavage, the splitting of that cell many times. And it forms like a little solid ball at first of cells. Then it starts to become a hollow um, ball of cells called the blastula. And then it starts to indent, which is going to form the digestive tract. And then eventually the cells start to become different from each other. Right now, through these stages, all of the cells are basically identical. It's just a ball of cells. But then after they start to develop a little further, they start to take on different jobs. They start to have different roles. That process is called differentiation. The cells are becoming different from each other. Some cells will go on to become skin cells. Some will go on to become cells of the nervous system or the digestive system, etc. So that happens pretty early in the development. Okay? Once that indentation starts to form, then the cells start to differentiate. Now, in some organisms, the embryo develops outside of the body. There's what we call external development. Most organisms that live in the water um, fertilize the eggs in the water, and then the eggs grow into embryos and then eventually hatch. Okay. Things like um, fish and amphibians, they just lay their eggs in the water. The male releases sperm in the water to fertilize the eggs, and then the eggs develop and hatch and go off on their own. Usually they don't have a shell of these eggs, like sometimes in a... a blob of jelly to sort of keep them together. Uh, and often they have to produce a lot of offspring because most of them aren't going to survive. Lots of them are going to be eaten or they're not going to have enough nutrients or oxygen to, to develop. So organisms that reproduce like this often have to produce many, many eggs so that some of them can survive. But organisms that live on land can't do that because land is dry. An egg, if they were to reproduce in the same way, the eggs would just dry up. So organisms that live on land, some of them lay eggs, like birds, for example, like reptiles, okay? Um, and these eggs are waterproof. There's like a little watery environment inside of the egg. That's its purpose. Um, and usually, there's energy stored in a yolk in an egg that the embryo inside will use as it grows and develops, and then eventually will hatch out of the egg to start uh, its life. So you can see a baby chick or a turtle or an insect, they hatch out of eggs. What, what will? The chick? Yeah, 
Right Maybe. Open the door. Maybe. They don't look very strong in these pictures, do they? No, but it's down the door. So here you could, this is what an actual um, electron microscope image of a developing embryo actually looks like. So we have the first stage, like the zygote. Then we have two cells because it's split into two, then four cells, then a little ball of cells. Then we could see the indentation starting to form. And this is when the cells are starting to take on those different jobs. And we could see here in this very early embryo, the outer layer becomes the cells of the skin and the nervous system. The middle layer becomes um, skeletal muscles and red blood cells and so forth. And then the inside layer becomes um, lung and some of the endocrine organs. So mammals, which includes humans, they have what's called internal development, right? They don't lay eggs for the most part. They keep the fertilized egg inside. That's called internal development. And the egg grows inside until it's ready to be uh, born and be survive on its own. Now marsupials, marsupials are animals that don't have a placenta. Okay. Um, do you know an example of a marsupial? Oh, it's on here, I guess. Um, so marsupials include things like koalas well, and kangaroos. What's that? I've seen the kangaroo one. The video? Yeah, I think I'm going to show you again. Um, oh, and so in marsupials, an embryo is, so they, they, they have internal fertilization, so they reproduce. That fertilized egg develops into a very immature offspring, which the, the mother gives birth to. Then it crawls into a pouch and it nurses for the rest of its development inside of this pouch until it's ready to become independent. Placental mammals, which include most other, ma most other mammals like us, for example, were placental mammals. They have the placenta forms after the embryo implants. And it allows, like we talked about, the exchange of materials between the mother's blood and the blood of the fetus. The embryos connected to the placenta by what organ? What connects the growing fetus to the placenta? The umbilical cord. The umbilical cord just has some blood vessels that take the blood out and bring it back in. Um, and then it, again, in the placenta, blood from the mother goes through capillaries that are next to capillaries from the fetus and material can be exchanged. Oxygen, nutrients, waste products, but there's not a direct connection. There are a couple egg laying mammals, but we won't really get into them. Here are some examples. This is a platypus. It's actually a mammal, but it lays eggs. So it's very unique. This is a, an echidna, spiny anteater. They both are egg-laying mammals. It's like, um... And they reproduce, again, they give birth, hatch, they, hatching out of these eggs are very immature young that have to be cared for before they're able to um, survive on their own. There are some marsupials. The only marsupial species we have around here are these. What are these things? Yeah, possums are marsupials. Annoying. Yeah, so there you see them around here a lot. They're, you see them at night often. They're nocturnal. You see them dead on the side of the road. Um, mm -hmm. But they give birth, again, to this offspring that's a tiny little embryo almost, and it just crawls and survives in the pouch of the mother until it's ready to survive on its own. Well, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not Koala? Yeah, they're pretty cute. All right. Here's the video. Oh. Did you, um, you saw the. I don't know if I'll be able to end it on. Hmm. I'll have to maybe I'll find it. I'll have to find it later, I guess. All right. That was a good video, too. <clears throat> um, 
so this is so placental mammals um like humans have this organ this is what it looks like this as a placenta that is filled with those blood vessels and again you can see the umbilical cord carrying blood back and forth to this organ so that transfer can this is what the umbilical cord looks like it's got um two arteries and a vein in there and this is the initial stage so remember fertilization happens in the oviduct after sperm are deposited in the vagina they make their way and swim through the cervix through the uterus into the oviduct where if there's an egg present they can fertilize it and then that zygote that forms and that embryo will sort of flow into the uterus and eventually attach it attaches to the wall of the uterus if you remember what we did with the menstrual cycle activity you saw the the lining of the uterus it's getting thickened it's getting ready for an embryo to implant there and once it does then the placenta starts to form you can see that here an amniotic sac around the embryo starts to form that's filled with fluid and then the embryo starts to grow so let's go back and start with fertilization so fertilization of the egg um, has to happen about 24 hours within 24 hours of the woman releasing the egg okay so um, you know that about halfway through the reproductive cycle the ovary op releases an egg cell which floats into the oviduct so if sperm are there during that time they can fertilize the egg and a woman can become pregnant once that cell is fertilized it starts to grow by mitosis into two cells and four cells and eight cells and so forth it goes through those phases we just talked about and then it eventually makes its way into the uterus where it attaches to the wall and then the placenta begins to form it's also within this sort of fluid filled sac right called the amniotic sac that helps sort of protect the fetus as it grows cushion it so it's not sort of just bumping around in there it's sort of in a little bubble a little pool of fluid that helps sort of as a shock absorber so there's some terms that we use um, if you've heard the term prenatal that means before the the fetus is born like there's um for example prenatal vitamins vitamins that a woman takes when she's pregnant to help make sure she has enough of certain vitamins or minerals to support the growing embryo the name the word zygote means the fertilized egg cell it's only in that zygote stage for a very short period of time once the zygote starts to divide and form a cluster of cells it's called an embryo up until the eight week point from eight weeks until birth it's called a fetus so that's what those different terms and you'll hear me sometimes say embryo or fetus and then eventually after labor and delivery then the baby's born it takes about 38 to 42 weeks for the fetus to grow fully you know, sometimes we say nine, a pregnancy is nine months. It's really closer to 10. Usually the doctor actually counts it by weeks. And so they'll try to figure out when a woman had her last period before she got pregnant and count from there. And 40 weeks later is usually her due date. Um, sometimes a woman could give birth before her due date, sometimes after her due date. But usually it, it's within ideally it's within two weeks before two weeks after um, so when a woman is pregnant things that she does can affect the developing embryo and fetus uh, for example typically a doctor will tell a woman not to drink any alcohol when they're pregnant or smoke or, smoke, or take drugs or um, you know eat unhealthily so all these things can affect the fetus because there's the the mother needs to have enough energy enough nutrients in her blood to support both her and the developing fetus 
she needs to eat more. Um, and like you said, certain things like alcohol can go through the placenta and can affect the fetus and affect its development, okay, in a negative way. Can, sometimes a woman might have a, a child that is a low birth weight, that it's smaller than usual, or a premature birth in which she has the baby before the 38 week point. So there's different, um, different things that a woman has to be aware of when she's pregnant. Um, and she goes to the doctor regularly to get a checkup and they can measure the, the growing fetus using an ultrasound. Like this is a, an ultrasound picture. This is, um, you know, they have a little yeah, have device. Yeah. You could get an ultrasound for lots of things like for your a knee or hip or whatever, check your, um, different parts of your body. If you're having some problem, it's also used, um, to see the developing fetus inside of the womb. And they can sometimes tell if it's a, a male or female. Um, they can tell how old it is, how big it is, and a bunch of other things by sort of looking at it. <clears throat> well, yeah, usually they don't do it routinely until, I don't know, was it 10 weeks or so? Yeah. That's what I remember. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been a long time since I had kids. Um, I think it's about 10 weeks. Um, yeah, b because it, when it's really, really small, they're, they're it's before the time when certain organs develop. They want to see the heart and make sure it's forming properly. And they want to make sure the heart rate is, is good. So they, they do that at a certain point. Um, and then they might do it at various times throughout the pregnancy. They could also do this process where they take a sample of cells from the amniotic fluid. They can use a, a sort of long needle. And that's what's shown here. They put it into the amniotic fluid and they can take out a little bit of this amniotic fluid and they can actually test it for various things. Okay, they can, they can do what's called a karyotype, which we'll talk about. They can see if for sure if it's male or female. <coughs> they can tell if there's any chromosome abnormalities as well by looking at um, this amniotic fluid. Uh, and sometimes the pregnancy doesn't complete. Sometimes the fetus doesn't grow and develop normally and stops growing. That's called, that's what a miscarriage is called. And it's pretty common. About 10 to 20% of pregnancies end up in a miscarriage. Um, and that's, that's the miscarriage is just a term for when um, the embryo doesn't survive. Okay. And it can't survive independently. This is sort of what things look like in the initial stages, okay? Um, so this is sort of um, from the very first stage of just a zygote. You could see how the embryo changes as it's going over, you know, the first um, 10 weeks or so. Yeah, that's just part of the development. It looks like it, uh, that, that we all start with a tail as we're developing embryos eventually gets reabsorbed back into the embryo. Um, you know, in the first stages, we, you know, all vertebrates kind of look the same, like a human embryo at um, four weeks looks <coughs> just like a chicken embryo or a horse embryo. You know, as time goes on, they start to differentiate more and start to look obviously more human-like. But on um, those initial stages, sometimes those are used as um, a way of uh, talking about the evidence for evolution that our early stages, we have gills in our early development, we have a tail early in development, and those things go way over time. Um, but all sort of vertebrates, it shows common ancestry. And by this point, this is, you know, about eight weeks or so, um, just at the end of the embryo stage looks pretty much like a human, right? Most of the organs have been formed and the time going after that is more about organs and organ systems maturing, about the embryo growing larger uh, and so forth. <clears throat> so eventually when the fetus is fully, ideally fully, um, fully developed, then the fetus is going to be born. We call that labor and delivery. When we, we talk about labor, 
that's the process. What hap- how, how does a woman know she's going to have a baby? Like if she's pregnant and close to her due date, like what happens that kind of tells her maybe she's going to have the baby soon? Start getting contractions, something else too. Does the uh, sac collapse cause them to leak? Yeah, so the amniotic sac might rupture. That's part of the natural process. And you might hear people talk about her water broke. What happens is this, this amniotic sac is filled with this amniotic fluid. Sometimes um, at, in the lead up to giving birth, it ruptures, right? And the liquid, the fluid, the amniotic fluid could leak out of the vagina. And that's how a woman knows probably she's having the baby soon. Because usually the doctor, once that happens, then like the protective barrier around the fetus is, is, is breached. So it's possible an infection could set in if too long went by. So usually they want the woman <coughs> to have the baby within like 24 hours of her water breaking. So that might happen. Sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes labor starts and contractions start and her amniotic sac doesn't rupture. So it could happen either way. But yeah, what are contractions, Isaiah? Do you know? What do you imagine when people, when you hear about a woman having contractions as she's been pregnant? It, yeah, so some, it's, it's the uterus. So the, the fetus is in the uterus. And as labor starting, the uterus is a muscle. It's a, a pouch-like muscle. This is the uterus, right? And to get ready to prepare to deliver the baby, the uterus contracts. It's like your bicep can contract or other muscles and it tightens up. Um, and so at first, it, they're spread far apart, maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes apart. Or every once in a while, one might feel the contraction happening um, and she knows that it's happening, but at first it might not be very painful or very intense and they're, they would be spread out usually. But as time goes on, as labor is progressing, they happen more often, more quickly. They become more intense and probably more painful too. And so what's happening as this, these contractions are going on is basically the, the fetus is being moved okay, down through the uterus and the cervix, the opening of the uterus is um, dilating it's opening up to allow the fetus to come out. And that process takes time. That's what the contractions are doing. Um, sometimes there's certain medications, a doctor, if, if they want her labor to go along more quickly, they can give an, a hormone called uh, Pitocin, which speeds up those contractions. Like my wife had Pitocin on when we had our first child because it was the um, her heart rate was going down and they wanted her to be born more quickly. So they gave my wife Pitocin and that really, she had the baby uh, pretty soon after that. Okay. Yeah. We'll talk about that too. As I said, good question. Um, so eventually, so, li- so labor is the contractions of the uterus. The cervix starts to dilate and open up and efface, which means sort of thin out so that the baby can fit through. What's the, does the baby come out head first usually or her feet first? Well, head, yeah, head first is the usual position. Do you know the name, what they say, if the, ba- if the fetus is not in that position? It's called in a breech position. So sometimes the fetus can be sort of uh, feet first, right? It's, yeah, it's generally harder for the baby to be born um, vaginally with feet first. Can get caught up in the yeah, it can. And, you know, that happened when we had two of our three daughters is that they're, so when a, a woman is giving birth, they put um, a monitor so they could tell the heart rate of the, of the baby and they're monitoring it all the time. And so like with my middle daughter, and my oldest daughter, their heart rate kept dropping. And so they thought maybe either the umbilical cord was like stretched or around their neck or something like that. And so um, they sort of monitor that carefully. If um, for some reason the fetus is under too much stress, its heart rate's dropping too low, the baby's not moving through the birth canal 
quickly enough. There's lots of different reasons they might do a C-section. And a C-section is basically they make an incision in the woman's abdomen, break, cut through the abdomen, the abdominal muscles, through the uterus, and through the amniotic sac, and they take the fetus out through the abdomen rather than a normal, what we call vaginal birth, through, through the um, baby being born through the vagina. Yeah, that's what they, yeah, they usually wouldn't prefer to do a C-section. Like usually they would want the woman to have the, the child vaginally. Um, but like you said, if there's some complication, if there's some problem with the health of the mother or the fetus, or they need to get it out quickly, um, then they can do a C-section as a, um, as an alternative. But they like to generally try to not do that. It's a lot, it's a longer recovery for the mother right? Because they had to cut through the muscle and, and so she needs to heal. So she has to be sort of um, yeah, resting more than having a vaginal birth. So yeah. Um, so eventually the, in, in a normal vaginal birth, then the fetus is moved through the, um, through the cervix, through the vagina. And at that point, the mother has to like push the baby out um, using her muscles. And eventually the baby is born. Uh, typically they'll cut the umbilical cord because the, the fetus is still attached to the placenta. And then after the baby is born, the placenta breaks away from the lining of the uterus. And then that comes out afterwards. Um, and the doctor will like feel on the mother's abdomen and make sure um, all of the placenta came out. Um, because if some of it stays in the uterus, it can get infected, um, and then then the baby's born. Um, I don't think. Let's see if this video works. A cesarean this section. Kind of, hold on. So the type of twins is determined by how the 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 twins are formed. Sometimes during ovulation, a woman might release two eggs at once. And if two eggs each get fertilized by two different sperm cells, they each grow into an embryo. But because they came from two different eggs and two different sperm cells, they're not going to be genetically identical to each other. They're going to, they could be uh, boy and girl. They could be boy and boy. They could be, they can look very different from each other. Maybe they look alike, but they're no more real. They're no more similar than any other brother and sister pair. That's fraternal twins. Identical twins are formed in a different way. Identical twins are formed when a single egg is released from an ovary. It gets fertilized and starts to form an embryo, but for some reason the embryo splits into two and each then grows into their own embryo. But because they came from the exact same sperm cell and exact same egg cell, they're identical. They have the exact same DNA. They're going to look identical to each other. They're both going to be male or female. They're going to be genetically a clone of each other. The other thing that could happen with identical twins is sometimes what I just explained happens, but they actually don't completely separate. This is rare, but if the two embryos that formed are still touching, they can form conjoined twins, twins which are connected in some way. Also called Siamese twins. Yeah, that, it used to be called Siamese twins. Now they would call it, it conjoined twins. And depending on which organs they share, might um, it might be impossible to separate them. If they share major organs between the both of them, sometimes they can't be separated. And sometimes they have to live their life conjoined forever. Um, so... Along the same lines, birth control to avoid um, pregnancy, there's different methods. Um, sometimes there are methods which use hormones so that a woman doesn't ovulate and release an egg and therefore she can't be pregnant. Um, sometimes there's a barrier is used during sex, like a condom, um, so that the sperm cells can't reach the egg cells. Sometimes a device can be um, inserted into uh, the woman's uterus called an IUD, which prevents her from getting pregnant 
um, by disrupting the sperm cells. Um, and then like we talked about the other day, there's permanent ways of a person um, that doesn't want to have children. A male can have a vasectomy where they cut the vas deferens. So sperm cells can't get out of the man's body and he can't make a woman pregnant. Or in a woman, the oviduct can be cut. So as she releases eggs during ovulation, they can't be fertilized. There's no way for the sperm cells to get to the eggs. And so she can't become pregnant in that way. What's that? Oh, yeah? Yeah. <clears throat> oh, so do you guys have this in your notes, the difference between the twins? I don't, yeah. you have those words? Okay. Um, and then the last, last thing we'll talk about. So as I was telling you, they can take a sample of, I, yeah, this is out of order. I, I rearrange this. This is like farther in your notes. I don't think you have anything to write. Um, they can take a sample of fluid from the amniotic sac and they can use it. What they do is they can take a picture of the chromosomes that are in that amniotic fluid and basically make a picture of it. Um, so we know, what's the, the normal number of chromosomes? 46. And they're, they arrange them in a diagram by size. The first pair of chromosomes are the longest chromosomes. You could see them here. And then the second are the second longest. So you can see they stain them. So they take out a certain pattern and they sort of pair them up. <coughs> so there's one set of chromosomes. The 23rd pair are called sex chromosomes, which typically determine the sex of the child. Males have two of the same sex chromosomes, two X chromosomes. I'm sorry, females have two X chromosomes. You can see that here. Males have the X chromosome, but then they have this other little chromosome called the Y chromosome. And that's what determines um, male or female. That's one of the things that determines their male or female at birth. Um, so you can see when a, a doctor makes one of these karyotype um, diagrams, they can also see if there's any abnormalities with the chromosomes. Because there are times, and I think somebody asked this a while back, when the chromosomes don't split properly and a person can end up with an extra chromosome. And that can happen um, depending on which chromosome is the extra chromosome. It can lead to different um, conditions. For example, Down syndrome is a set of conditions that happen when a person gets an extra 21st chromosome. So um, that's something that the doctor would be able to tell by looking at all of these chromosomes. Okay? Here we have a person that had an extra X chromosome. That's called Kleinfelter syndrome. Okay. There's other types of um, chromosome differences like having an extra 13th chromosome. Um, but by far the most common one is Down syndrome, which is when a person has an extra 21st chromosome. And so ha that extra chromosome, that extra genetic mat material um, leads to a variety of health conditions that are that are what we call um, Down syndrome and include some heart issues and digestive issues or developmental delays. All those things that uh, go into that are because of this extra chromosome. Um, there's also other types of chromosome. If a chrom piece of a chromosome gets split off, that can happen um, as well. There's a variety of different chromosome abnormalities that, that sometimes take place in people. Typically, there, more than one extra chromosome doesn't happen because there's so many um, issues associated with that that the embryo doesn't develop. And so um, typically it's just one extra chromosome or one missing chromosome that uh, people are born with. Any questions about any of our birth and 